It has been two months since the waters began to rise and the forest trees became submerged. They will remain submerged for months to come. Normally, trees would die after just a few weeks of flooding because their roots cannot receive oxygen. But the roots of these Amazonian trees can survive being submerged for much longer due to a special adaptation. When their roots become waterlogged, a membrane forms on the outside of the root. But inside, there is partial cell death and that creates air spaces. These spaces act as air holes to transfer oxygen and remove toxins. This strategy allows the trees to succeed in two very different worlds. Amazingly, there is greater diversity of trees where the forests are submerged than anywhere else in Amazonia. The coming of the floods and submerging of the forests is the trigger for another important event. It's the time when many fish begin breeding. This discus fish uses its narrow body to penetrate deep within the foliage to lay eggs where enemies won't find them. It constantly watches over the precious brood for two days until hatching. Of all tropical fish, discus are among the most beautiful and highly prized because of their rich colors and patterns. But during spawning, their bodies lose the rich pattern and become darker, as they prepare to give their offspring a precious gift. A day after they hatch, the fry start swimming. They keep very close to mother and father. So close, some appear to be mouthing the bodies of their parents. In fact, the first meal for young discus is a mucus secretion from the skin of their parents called discus milk. This special meal gives the young a great start in life. At breeding time, some fish go to extraordinary efforts to find a safe place to lay their eggs. Close by overhanging leaves, pairs of Capella arnold die gather. These tiny fish have a huge challenge ahead of them. The male has the long tail. The female is ready to spawn, the eggs visible through her skin. The pair move together near the surface. Sometimes pausing, sometimes darting back and forth with urgency. What is about to happen is a most remarkable spawning achievement. Prompted by the male, the two fish leap together high out of the water where they cling to a hanging leaf. They hold on for about three seconds before first the female, then the male drop back, leaving behind a small cluster of eggs. They're called jumping kerosene, and each leap adds more eggs to the cluster. The male's fully expanded pectoral and abdominal fins act as suckers, allowing the pair to hold on to the leaf. They continue until there are about 50 eggs, all covered with gel to keep in the moisture. But the performance isn't yet over. The male chases the female away, 
then begins the job of preventing the eggs from drying out in the hot sun. He does this by splashing them. As he smacks the water surface with his back fin, water splashes onto the leaf above. He's amazingly accurate and continues until the eggs hatch. By the next day, they have already developed eyes. And the following day, prompted by the water splashes, the eggs begin to hatch. The fries enter the river with the falling water drops of their father's splashes. As they hit the water, the young fish seek out a hiding place among the leaves. Young Capella Arnoldi have inherited a bizarre but successful strategy for spawning above the waters of the flooded woodland that now becomes their protector. Amazonia is not one continuous forest. Close to the rivers, there are broad, grassy plains that are rich in sediment. In the wet season, these plains are transformed into fields of floating aquatic plants of many kinds. Once the waters have risen, plants grow quickly in the intense heat of the equatorial sun. But without doubt, the most spectacular is the Queen Victoria water lily with leaves of two meters or more in diameter. Their leaves expand over the water surface, pushing others aside as if each mighty leaf is striving to take as much of the sun's energy as possible. The fringes are raised to prevent flooding and armed with toxic spines, probably as defense against animals that would eat them. It takes one month for plants to grow out of the submerged plain and for new leaves to completely open. As Amazonian floodwaters expand dramatically and spectacularly, so do the leaves of Queen Victoria water lilies, with help from the equatorial sun. Water lettuce has a different growth strategy to the water lily. During the wet season, it expands by producing new young heads at a spectacular rate. But water lettuce has no protective spines and no toxins. And that makes it most appealing to Amazonia's largest herbivore. The Amazonian manatee, or fish cow, is related to the elephant. One thing the 300 kilogram manatee shares with its land-bound relative is a voracious appetite. Each animal consumes 30 kilograms of water plant a day. Fortunately, there's plenty of water lettuce. As floodwaters rise, a few small plant heads appear. Soon, those heads double and redouble again and again, and within weeks, cover vast areas. Water lettuce and the other floating plants of Amazonia grow mainly in the wet season. So manatees must eat huge amounts of food now in order to build up enough reserves to survive the coming dry season. Another reason for the manatee's enormous appetite is that the water plants contain so few nutrients that close to half of all they eat remains undigested. The manatees give the undigested material back to the river as feces. But in Amazonia, manatee waste is not wasted. Far from it. 
their feces rain down like riches from above. Many fish feed on the waste directly, and it also helps support the lives of thousands of other species. Most nutrients in manatee waste dissolve to fertilize the water and helps the growth of more plant life. But in addition, manatee grazing creates gaps in the layer of floating plants. This allows the intense heat and light of the equatorial sun to penetrate. Sunlight and nutrients can now trigger the growth of vast amounts of plankton, which is the basis of another aquatic food chain. So fish cows, simply by eating and digesting, help maintain more than 3,000 species, or nearly a third of all freshwater fish in the world. Those fish include the beautiful, like cardinal tetra, and angelfish. There are the bizarre, like the surface-hugging hatchetfish, and there are the bountiful, like catfish. Catfish are the largest fish family in Amazonia. Nearly 1,500 species, or half of all fish here, are catfish. And their shape is as varied as their size and their lifestyle. A streamlined shape reduces water resistance. A sleek body can flee quickly from enemies. Armoured scales offer protection from enemies. Sailfin pleco hide among submerged trees. Leaf catfish drift undetected and imperial zebras feed hidden among rocks. Catfish, more than any other fish, exploit the great variety of environments in Amazonia. Which means that catfish, more than any other fish, end up on the menu of the river wolf. Giant otters are dangerous and aggressive, and often hunt in family groups. A giant otter brings its catch to a favorite eating place. To fuel its active and energetic lifestyle, an otter eats 10% of its own body weight, or three kilograms of fish each day. It eats everything, even crushes bones. But even the otter's powerful jaws can't crush a big catfish's skull. This will feed others. What an otter discards, a school of piranha quickly devour. Like catfish, piranha are a large family of fish. There are over 30 species here. The red piranha is the most common and most feared. But even they are on the river wolf's menu. What's left of the piranha, other piranha will dispose of. 